I might just say a little bit about how I've chosen these examples, which is basically that there is a lot of work done on various ways of valuing biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I've tried to be guided by two principles, one to look for examples that are fairly common. So there is a lot of papers done on water purification. There are a lot of papers done in coastal protection. And there are a lot of papers done on pollination as well. And in addition to scientific papers being done on these subjects, they also show up fairly frequently in the popular and advocacy literature. If you look at a conservation NGO, it's likely that they'll say among the reasons that we need to preserve diverse natural ecosystems are to provide water purification, provide coastal protection, provide pollination services. Now they will probably also go on to say and to provide opportunities for recreation and uh, to provide groundwater recharge and, and similar things. But again, I'm trying to give some examples of, of things that I think are fairly typical of a lot of what you see in the literature. Uh, just as a quick reminder, I am steering away from stated preference approaches from surveys and so forth. Um, just we don't have time for everything. So I'm going to concentrate on these things. So since I do want to get through a fair bit of material and the time I have remaining with you, I'll jump right into it. Uh, last time we were talking about the next topic, or I just began to introduce the next topic, coastal protection. So particularly in countries like India, tropical cyclones such as this one off the coast of Madrista cause immense damage from high waves and wind when they hit the coast. If natural coastal vegetation, such as these mangroves, were maintained, then we might reduce the amount of damage results from winds and waves and storm surge and prevent human and uh, structural tragedies like this as occurring. So I talk about coastal protection. Again, there's been a great deal of interest in this topic. And while you sometimes see references to temperate areas, such as there's been work on the northeastern coast of the United States and whether or not Superstorm Sandy, a tropical hurricane that made it farther north than usual, would have produced less damage if more coastal ecosystems that maintained. A lot of the interest has been in the tropics. Uh, much of the focus has been on providing protection against storms. Although there's also been work on some of the other services provided by coastal mangrove ecosystems, such as providing nursery areas for uh, young fish and crustaceans. Now we talked a little bit also about some of the perils in thinking about taking a static view of things, assuming that the patterns of storms we've seen in the past are gonna be similar to the stat patterns in the future and that the sea level is gonna stay where it is. Now, obviously, as the sea level rises and or if storms become more intense, the protection afforded by coastal ecosystems could be more important. On the other hand, though, we're going to see that for natural reasons that will make intuitive sense to all of us, uh, there are going to be diminishing returns in coastal ecosystem protection. Taken to an absurd extreme, we would not cover the entire subcontinent in tropical forests in order to provide protection because then there would be no less no places left for people to be protected for the people who are protecting to live in. So there's gonna be a limit as to how large an area of, of tropical forest we want to maintain. And this notion has been observed in various studies. This is a fairly non-technical piece that appeared in Science uh, 2008 by Ed Barbier and a number of his co-authors. Incidentally, if you're interested in the encyclopedic collection of work on coastal storm protection and services provided by mangrove e ecosystems, Ed Barbier has probably published as much as on these topics as anyone in the world. But what Ed and his co-authors did in this paper was just basically summarize some work. They were looking at the coast of Thailand, where there was a trade-off being considered. Should they maintain the natural mangrove forests on the coast that were preventing storm damage, or should they allow more of those forests to be cut and cleared in order to make ponds for, for raising commercial shrimp, largely for export? As you can see here, coastal protection values go up, but go up at a decreasing rate, concave function that we're, we're generally used to. On the other hand, because the shrimp are sold on world markets, the amount of protection provided in any particular place, 
the amount of coastal ecosystem uh, maintained in the in the in any given place doesn't really affect, affect the world price of shrimp or the profitability of shrimp farming. So the more mangrove areas set aside, we have a roughly linear decline in the benefits that can arise from the alternative activity of shrimp farming. Combine that upward but concave function with the downward but linear slope function, and you get naturally enough a single peak to total benefit function. I'm ignoring a couple of smaller values down there, but a single peak benefit function indicating that Barbier and his colleagues found in this case in Thailand, you would want to preserve some of the coastal forest. You would not want to preserve all of the coastal forest, which again, I think makes sense. Yes. Well, the net, but the cost is the opportunity cost. Sorry, I'm, I'm going through this a little too quickly, I guess. But the cost is the opportunity cost of the profits that can be earned from converting the habitat to shrimp farming. So those, those revenues are going down, which shift the axis around becomes a cost. Okay, so I think fairly straightforward idea here. We're looking for what we economists always look for, interior optimum. What is the appropriate level of environmental degradation to incur, given that there are, as we just said, opportunity costs of preserving these natural environments? Now, this raises another question, and this sort of goes to what we talked about last time, is, well, if we want to find out what these values are, if we want to make these comparisons between benefits and costs, how are we going to go about the empirical analysis of doing this? And one suggestion you might have is do an econometric study. Look at the degree to which coastal vegetation has been preserved. Look at the damage results when storms occur as a function of the intensity of storms and the amount of coastal vegetation preserved and see if we can tease out the empirical relationship. Uh, this was in fact, uh, what the procedure taken by Bob Costanza and numerous co-authors also in 2008, in which they had a US data set on exactly that sort of data, damage from tropical hurricanes on the East Coast and South Gulf Coast of the United States over, I believe it's a couple of decades, uh, and then said, well, how does that damage vary with the amount of storm protection or the amount of habitat providing protection against storms? Uh, they found significant values, but in many cases, it wasn't enough to offset the opportunity costs of nearshore land use. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I should have looked up the numbers before coming in, but um, they came up with fairly some, uh, some fairly substantial values. I think in some areas, it was on the order of a million dollars a hectare, million US dollars per hectare of land. But if you think about the coast of New Jersey, coast of New York, coastal areas in Connecticut, U.S. states in which, I don't know if many of you are familiar with U.S. geography, but <laughs> the coastal areas of Connecticut is where the rich people in New York have their houses. So as you can imagine, the opportunity cost of not having a beachfront home exceeded the coastal storm protection values that Costanza and his co-authors found. Um, so again, it's the they did not necessarily find that they had come up with a compelling argument. This is somewhat problematic though, because, um, and just as a quick aside, uh, an economist will never recommend to you the works of Robert Costanza as guidance on how to do economics. And while Costanza was working with some economist co-authors, I think they did ignore the crucial idea that we were talking about last time. Certainly the degree to which storms occur is exogenous, is exogenously determined with regard to what happens to be put on the shore and at risk in storms. But the amount of damage that's going to occur is, is of course a function of the value of the structures that could be damaged. The degree to which those structures are put in place in, place, in areas where they could be subject to storms is really just the degree to which those areas have been cleared of their natural vegetation to provide protection against storms. So we could have a large endogeneity problem that the both the amount of habitat provided to provide protection against storms 
and the value of the damages incurred could be jointly determined by omitted variables. So this runs into the problem I talked about last time. And remember I said last time, right? I put a, a quote up on the screen last time saying that this, this problem of endogeneity and determining land use and the value affected by land use it's going to be very, very difficult to overcome by finding instrumental variables or identifying natural experiments. And we have to think very carefully about doing this. So bottom line, Costanza et al. found very small values, but I think there are reasons to think that their results were biased by endogeneity. So the approach many researchers have taken is not necessarily to try to do statistical studies per se, but to build models of the effect of coastal vegetation on storm protection, calibrate those models to data they can find and uh, see what the results are. And I'm <laughs> disappointed to see that Satanami is not uh, uh, in attendance today because uh, Satanami Das and co-authors have done some very interesting work on these questions. Uh, a study that many of you may have run across was, was done by Das and Jeff Vincent published in 2009 in the U.S. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And one of the main reasons I didn't put this paper on the reading list was simply that it's a papers published in the Proceedings of the National Academy tend to be crushed down quite a bit and you don't have a lot of the background material. So I didn't assign this paper, but again, it's, it's one that you likely have come across because I think it's gotten a fair bit of attention. And basically they did with a, a carefully calibrated model demonstrated that many lives were saved in Otrisa at the time of the 1999 cyclone in areas in which more of the coastal vegetation had been maintained. Now, I wasn't aware until I got here and then I had a, a very useful exchange with uh, Dominique that there is also a follow-up paper, which she did with Anne-Marie Crepon, <laughs> my French is, is as bad as my Hindi, which is to say non-existent. Anyway, Das and Crepon uh, did a very interesting paper in 2013, which I had an opportunity to review. And in fact, I think it's so interesting. I'd like to share some of the details with you if you are not familiar with it. So what they did is they provided a really very detailed description in this paper on the value of coastal protection. And one of the reasons I admire this work is it does a very nice job of matching the natural science to the economically relevant aspects of the situation. So one of the things we want to think about is, and let's take a step back to some of the things I talked about in the very opening, the very first couple of lectures, we can think about the value of ecosystem services and how they contribute to the production of something. The production we're looking at here is basically storm protection. So we can look at what is the marginal product of, of a hectare of coastal forest in reducing the damage from storms. Or equivalently, we can say, what is the marginal reduction in cost, marginal reduction in damages resulting from storms achieved by maintaining an extra hectare of mangrove forest along the coastline. This is exactly what the Das experiment paper does. So wind and waves come in. Uh, they, both wind and waves, may hit structures with kinetic energy, and that's going to result in storm damage. Uh, so to the extent that areas of coastal forests slow the winds and reduce the height of the waves, they're going to reduce the damage that eventually occurs in inland areas. Uh, their paper looks at both wind and wave damage, but for simplicity, I'm gonna focus on the wave side of it. That is, the waves come in, kinetic energy may be, uh, to use a technical term, smacking structures and causing damage. And also, of course, you get flooding the farther inland the water inundates, the more flood water you're going to get, and it's going to be result in flood damage. So I'll focus on waves. And the critical issue here is as a physical proposition, the uh, energy embodied in waves is proportional to the square of the wave height. I think 
Again, I'm an economist because I wasn't smart enough to figure out physics when I was an undergrad, but my understanding is that this is, is basically just Newtonian theory that the, the, the energy something is going to get is a false in these proportions, the square of the height of the falls. And then, of course, we're going to reduce the height of waves by basically you reduce the height of the wave by putting something in front of it so it, it hits the mangrove forest rather than the building first. Okay, damage depends on the velocity of the waves, which is related to the height of the waves. And the wave height depends on the width of the vegetation that the wave has to traverse from its, its position or from its initial height in open waters until the point at which it encounters the structure. And again, this could be related both to the energy that it is carrying when it makes contact with the structure, as well as the faster that wave's moving. You know, we've all been on the, I assume we've all, at least as kids run along the coast of the seashore to outrun the waves and bigger waves come farther inland, of course, and therefore cause more flooding. Uh, for the purposes of their simulation model, they just took a fixed configuration of this is where the shore is, this is where the vegetation is, this is where the structures are. And then they assumed, uh, following the natural science literature, wave height is an exponentially declining function of the distance of uh, ecosystem traverse. Velocity is proportional to square centimeters. I mean, water, the square root of the height. And then uh, they fit a function which they had extensive data on the amount of damage suffered in tropical cyclones and said, okay, as a function of the velocity of the incoming waves, we're going to assume a power function which we can fit the parameter of the power function relating damage to the velocity of the incoming waves and fit that to data on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, fit that to data on the intensity of storms. What's M? I'm sorry? M. M, oh, M, I'm sorry. That's, that's the critical thing. It's a good thing I mentioned that. M is, why did I choose M? That's sort of a stupid choice of variables. Uh, M is the width of the, uh, of the area, uh, mangroves. It's coming back to me. It's the width of the fo mangrove forest that they have to go over. So M would be measured in meters of mangrove forest over which the wave waves traverse in making their way inland. Now I referred to area earlier, but area is going to be width divided by length along the seashore. So when I talk about area, I'm talking about an area of a particular width. And then we think about increasing the area by increasing the width to provide greater protection along the shore. So Combining all those things, and this isn't really important for where we're going other than just to say, combining all these things, we get subsuming all of those parameters into a couple of, of simple forms, we get a declining exponential function relating the amount of damage to constants, all of these factors that were constants of proportionality in the other uh, functions I put up. M, which <laughs> Srikant just reminded us, is the width of the mangrove buffer, or the area of mangrove buffer uh, along the coast. And then a parameter, which we're going to be able to calibrate from the evidence uh, in the data. So you're assuming constant depth. You're just saying how long. No, we're assuming constant length and, uh, and we're thinking about how wide it is. So the area of coastline is fixed. Okay. So, sorry, I should have been clear about that. We have the coastline of India or the coastline of a state within India is essentially fixed. And so we're asking how much, how wide a buffer along that coast we should maintain. Okay, so this form, for those of you who've been to the previous talks, you'll see this form is familiar. Declining exponential functions, what we saw when we talked about bioprospecting, uh, it's what we also saw in some of the pollution treatment stuff. And so, so I guess sort of an interesting coincidence that this declining exponential form also arises in this context. But then that's gonna mean that if we ask what is the service provided, what is the marginal reduction in damage achieved by increasing that width along the coastline by an additional meter, we're gonna get another familiar looking function, which says that the reduction in damage is this parameter, 
this ex exponential decay rate times e raised to that parameter to the mth power. And remember when we saw this form before, we, we saw or we noted what its implications were for the value of the marginal unit of area providing the ecosystem service. Implication is if that parameter is big, that's great because it means that each additional meter is reducing the, the energy in the incoming waves by a large amount. But in terms of valuation, it also means there isn't that much energy remaining to be dissipated after you've already established a fairly wide buffer. So why did Barbier and his co-authors find, remember that concave function relating the value of coast? Why did they find that? Well, presumably because of some, some interpretation or an interpretation such as this, that as you get more or as you have more of the coast devoted area along the coast devoted to providing the ecosystem service, then the marginal contribution of each additional meter of width becomes proportionally less. And then I've talked various times about what I've referred to as a paradox of efficiency. Paradox of efficiency means in this case, if each meter is fairly effective at reducing the energy, proportionally reducing the energy of incoming waves, then we don't need a lot of meters in order to provide protection. So this is in terms of conservation policy, another sort of good news, bad news scenario. Good news is if some of these, uh, some of these coastal mangrove systems are pretty effective in reducing the energy of incoming waves, then we can justify some conservation of those coastal mangrove systems. Bad news is, from a conservation perspective again, bad news is that, well, if they're very effective, a little goes a long way and you don't need a lot. So it may not produce large conservation benefits. Also worth noting, I think I said a little bit about this. Sorry, I'm a little raspy today. Uh, I said a little about this last time. It also means that if, if the mangrove systems are not providing a great deal of protection per meter, if that parameter is not very large, it may mean that you could get the same protection by alternative methods, such as simply increasing the uh, storm resistance of the structures themselves. So there is, there may be uh, in many situations, instances in which in economic terms, we'd be at a corner solution in which you would preserve zero of the coastal mangrove forest because you could substitute for the storm protection service by building stronger structures. So again, just, want to think carefully about what are the motivations for conservation provided by some of these incentives. I'm afraid the, the lessons can come through again in this, this analysis may be that if they're very effective, if mangroves are very effective in reducing storm intensity, we may want to save some, but we may not want to save a lot. If they're not very effective, we may have other alternatives that work better. Uh -huh. Uh, most of it, <laughs> I think is, I think the, the last bit is the, probably the most problematic bit as I understand it is the damage function, the row. I believe uh, the nominee and her and Griffin uh, just use that, fit it to the data. Um, I think, what was the old uh, phrase about models? Um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. Um, so the, the overriding point here is I think in a lot of cases, we can come up with some basic ideas from the physics and biology, but really the overriding point is I think fairly straightforward. And let me just, let me repeat the, what I think is a fairly straightforward overriding point. We don't need to have exactly this function. 
But what we have is a combination of two considerations. One is what does an additional meter of mangroves provide in terms of reduction of intensity of wind and waves? And the other is how high are the wind and waves after you've already installed several meters? So the trade-off is regardless of the functional form, we're still gonna get this trade-off that if a system is, in, is very effective in providing the service, then uh, there may not be much more of the service for it to provide once we've already set aside a fairly large area. Well, the cost of maintaining the coastline is whatever it is. So we can, we can take a look at essentially property markets and say, what would somebody pay for the right to purchase an area of mangroves and convert it to shrimp ponds or seaside apartments or whatever? So then we're saying, okay, we know we have some idea from observed behavior what the opportunity cost of preserving those mangroves is because the Storm Protection Service has strong public good aspects, we don't have a comparable estimate of what the marginal benefits are. But what we do have is a record of the damages that occurred in previous coastal flooding episodes that we're now going to relay. And basically this is a avoided damage or avoided cost approach. No. So yes, well, <laughs> no, we're not making that assumption. And yes, I take your point that we should be considering a wide suite of ecosystem services. And they could be everything from the coastal protection services and the additional services or value services provided by, remember I mentioned early on, these systems also may enhance the productivity of fisheries. They may also enhance opportunities for people to engage in recreation. They may also have broader global values. They may have carbon sequestration values. They may have biodiversity protection values that we should all pay for. So no, we're not getting at all those aspects, but we're doing two things, I think. One is saying, okay, if we wanna add those values up, what can we assign to this piece of it? We'll see in a second what Sadamani and, and her co-author assigned to that piece of it. The other thing though, is remember what I've been underscoring here is those marginal values probably decline pretty quickly. So let's say that we say a 50 meter wide buffer provides a value of this amount. You try to do something in my head and it's not gonna work. Uh, <laughs> if we then double the width of, of that, uh, of that area, then we're gonna, we're gonna have e to the negative two times the value, right? Or double it. Anyway, you get what I'm driving at. We're gonna have a substantially lower value. So one of the things we also wanna think about here is, okay, we wanna add up those surface values. We wanna add up the fishery regeneration. We wanna add up the biodiversity. We wanna add up the carbon. But as we widen the area providing those services, as we increase the area of coastal buffers, we can't just take the value of the 50th meter and assume it applies to the 100th meter for the coastal protection value. It may well be the case that as we go from 50 to 100 meters, 
the marginal value of if the additional coastal protection becomes negligible. So as we think about these other values, we want to think about, okay, which of these arguments is going to be compelling for providing wider margins, bigger areas. So let's uh, going to have to run through this because I really want to get to pollination, which I've been uh, waiting for enthusiastically here. Uh, anyway, uh, let's just quickly jump to the values here. Uh, they come up with a value in 1995 US, 1999, pardon me, US dollars, about $177 a hectare. Uh, that was not significant relative to the opportunity cost. And this is what I was talking about, the opportunity cost of conversion using the wood, et cetera, about $3,800 US, US dollars a hectare. Uh, I really want to get to pollination, so I'm going to talk about this really, really fast. But I think there is actually a, uh, another concern here is they looked at the value of reducing storm damage from a storm that produced winds of 200 kilometers per hour, roughly speaking. We would also want to know, well, what is the probability distribution of storms creating winds of 200 kilometers per hour? If you think about the probability distribution of, of the of the size of incoming storms, then we'd, we'd want to correct this figure by two factors. I divided by delta, assuming delta is the discount rate here, to get a net present value. So that's going to greatly increase the annual values. But then what's the probability of uh, a tense storm coming along? So Dominic said in a sidebar conversation we had, that is about 15% a year. Uh, that this sort of storms would hit in the area that she was looking at. So very broadly speaking, we'd want to do this. We'd want to extend this analysis to think about the probability distribution of storms as well as the damage from any particular type of storm. However, I do want to talk about pollination. So now I'm going to switch. This is Epis mellifera. Dr. Singh, how did I do? Is that <laughs> my pronunciation, Apis mellifera? European honeybee, which is used in many areas. I'm not sure, do you use European honeybees in India? <laughs> okay. <laughs> may, or, <laughs> <laughs> may or may not have European honeybees in India, but in vast parts of the world, particularly the United States, European honeybees are used, exotic species used for pollination of, of fruit crops and other crops in the United States, as well, of course, as Europe. Uh, honeybees aren't the only sort of insects that engage in pollination. Here's a butterfly doing it. Uh, looking again at our expert in entomology, my understanding is a butterfly is a moth, is a moth that comes out during the day. Is that more or less accurate? Yeah, so butterflies are pretty, moths are pesky, but both can provide pollination services. Um, incidentally, um, this is a bat providing pollination services. Anyone know what it's providing pollination services to? I'll give you a hint. Uh, it's very important in my son's uh, lives in, in university. This is the mescal plant from which uh, tequila is. Do you all have tequila here? <laughs> from which tequila is produced. So this is a bat pollin uh, pollinating or fertilizing a, a tequila flower. And if, uh, if there were no bats pollinating tequila flowers, my son's college experience would have been ever so much worse or better, depending on the way you look at it. And then you also have birds providing this service. So pollination, important service, and also one that is features prominently in a lot of the ecological literature, ecological economic literature. So for example, I uh, gave you a quote in the first presentation, if you may recall, from Paul Armsworth, and his co-authors, and they really underscored the importance of pollination as being an important ecosystem service. And in the recent World Bank report on the economic values of nature, they emphasized the importance of pollination. And there have been a lot of very interesting studies of pollination. Uh, why is maintaining natural habitat important? Because the pollinating organisms, the birds, bats, bees, and butterflies, four bees of pollination, I guess, uh, they, uh, they may need nesting and alternative foraging habitat, as well as uh, escape from predators uh, during periods in which they're not actively going out and pollinating food crops. Uh, a couple of important things to remember, though, is that I think 
You often hear statistics about pollination, and some of them I think can be misleading. It is true that many varieties of crops require insect pollination or animal pollination, uh, but there are also many varieties of crops that rely on wind pollination or self-pollinated or, or vegetatively propagated or whatever, basically do not require insect pollination. And so you run also run across statistics such as this, saying that, let's just say in very broad terms, 10% of the value of, of agricultural production uh, is dependent on insects. Now, to be fair, I try to call out uh, statements that are made that reflect bad economics. In a sense, this statement also reflects bad economics. That what they're saying is basically a 5%, if insects vanish, 5% of crop value in wealthy countries or 8% of crop value in developing countries would, would disappear. That's not right, of course, because what would happen if all the fruits that require pollination disappeared? Well, presumably, as the pollinators disappeared, the prices would skyrocket. So again, we can look at the, the number of crops require pollination, but uh, but the value of crops would certainly go up as the, as the number of pollinators declined. But we do want to think carefully about marginal value, and I want to underscore another aspect of this is you often encounter statistics in the literature, and regrettably even sometimes in the literature that uh, purports to be taken an economic perspective, saying that a certain crop Y X percent of the value of a, the harvest of a certain crop of Y was pollinated by species Z. Therefore, the value of species Z is X percent of the value of Y. No, 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 no. If, if pollinators are abundant, the fact that a certain fraction of a crop was pollinated by a certain species may be irrelevant if there are adequate numbers of the other species that can perform the service as well. So we want to think clearly about how do we infer marginal value of pollination. So just to underscore the point, if it is the case there are a lot of pollinators of two species and one of those species disappears and other pollinators, the other species could come, then as an economic proposition, it's not all that important. Okay, now let's talk about a couple of ways of estimating the value of pollination. And you may have noticed one of the things I haven't really talked about is another approach to, to doing empirical economics that's gained a lot of currency, particularly in development studies, which is of course just controlled trials. Now, what we typically cannot do in controlled trials is say, okay, here's a farm that benefits from the service of this area of forest. And here's a farm with a similar area of forest. What we're gonna do is cut down the entire area of forest and then do say that we've randomly chosen which area of forest to cut down and then compare the productivity because we don't go in and cut down entire areas of forest. However, with pollinators, you've got a, a neat alternative. This is a native bee on the flower of a coffee plant. Um, to be honest, I stole this picture off the web, so I'm not sure exactly where it's taken, but this is a bee coffee, pollinating a coffee plant flower. This is not a coffee plant. I can't remember what sort of fruit tree it was, but I couldn't find one of a pollinator exclusion experiment. I, anyway, I couldn't find one of a pollinator exclusion experiment on a coffee plant, but this is what's referred to as a pollinator exclusion experiment. What you do is you take the flowers of a plant, and we'll go into a, in a moment how, how the flowers are related to reproduction. But basically, very, very quick view is reproduction is going to be enhanced by pollinating insects, landing on a flower, depositing pollen. Pollen contains sperm, which then leads to the generation, to the fertilization of a, an egg within an ovum, which leads to a seed, which leads to, in this case, a coffee berry. Exclude the pollinators from the plant by putting this fine mesh bag around it. So wind and sunlight can still get to the flowers, 
but, uh, but bees can't. And so why did they do this exclusion? Well, they wanted to compare, let me go on to the next slide. They wanted to compare the productivity of coffee fields. I'm not sure if you all can see this from where you're sitting, but areas A, B, and C were remnant forests around a place called the Finca de Santa Fe coffee plantation in Costa Rica. The central area here marked F is in the middle of the plantation. I represents intermediate places, intermediate distance from the areas of remnant forest, A, B, and C. And the Ns represent areas that are near to the remnant forest. Now, I'm not an expert on coffee pollination or really for that matter, any other sort of pollination, but my understanding is coffee is a plant which benefits from cross pollination by pollinators taking uh, pollen from one flower to another, but is not entirely dependent on this cross pollination. It can self pollinate, so or wind pollinate. So what they're doing essentially is saying, okay, by putting those enclosure bags around the coffee flowers, we have replicated a situation. We have replicated the situation in an area far from where the natural pollinators are found. So they verify by studies that there are not any natural pollinators found in this area. So they say, okay, if the yield on plants with the bags around them is roughly the same here as it is in the center, then we can infer the difference in the yield for the plants from which pollinators have not been excluded to the presence of the pollinators. And the presence of the pollinators is related to the area of the natural forest. So this is an interesting experiment. They found that values were in fact about, if I remember correctly, about 20% higher yields, coffee yields were about 20% higher in the areas closer to the pollinators. However, when I revisited the state and did some calculations, it was sort of iffy as to whether or not that would be enough to, to justify maintaining the areas of remnant forest. And of course, to your question, if, we're, if we have sort of an iffy proposition on whether we should do it just for the benefits of pollinators, then chances are we should encourage conservation for other reasons. But they found that there was not really a strong case to be made for the value of pollination services. The really uh, sad, in a way, sort of thing about this study, and it's, uh, this is uh, Ricketts and a number of co authors in 2004. Sad thing about it was that every last coffee tree on the Finca de Santa Fe plantation was torn out of the ground because it became more profitable to plant pineapple. Pineapple does not depend on insect pollination at all. So, the value of the pollination services was obviated by the change in the crop. Okay, that was one study. Uh, Taylor Ricketts, so one of the lead authors of that first study, has gone on to do a variety of other work in pollination. And the other work has been looking more at sort of what we were talking about with Sadamini's uh, study of coastal uh, areas, doing a specifying production functions or bio, biological and economic relationships and trying to calibrate those to the data. So this is another study done by Ricketts and Eric Lonsdorf published in 2013. And basically this summarizes the finding that if you have the area of forest within a certain uh, perimeter of a uh, plantation, then the marginal product or the value of the marginal product of additional forest cover is high when you have very little forest cover and correspondingly low when you have a lot of forest cover. Again, diamonds and water diminishing returns got a lot of something, a little extra of it isn't worth all that much. So basically uh, they calibrated models, pollinated numbers and habitat condition. Uh, da, da, da. Related to forest areas and they, uh, this is actually a slight simplification of, of their production function. 
And this isn't the production function, this is the yield gap, as it were. So y sub zero is the amount of a crop that could be produced in a particular area if there were sufficient number of pollinators available that essentially all of the crops, all of the plants, uh, all of the plants in the area receive full pollination. Y would be the actual amount of pollination. Beta and alpha are parameters and P is the number of pollinators. So again, the, the size of this gap diminishes the number of pollinators, which is just another way of saying that the marginal product of additional pollinators falls off. Okay, um, let me now talk a little bit more about a model that this to me makes intuitive sense. And I, again, I am <laughs> curious as to whether this will make as much sense to somebody who is an expert in the, uh, in the entomology. Um, although I got it past the journal editor, so <laughs> at least the uh, agricultural economists uh, went along with this. So let's consider a situation in which this is the uppercase Greek letter phi. Let's suppose the total number of flowers that a farmer plants in their field is phi. Now, why is the total number of flowers important? Because flowers are, as, we, as I said a moment ago, the reproductive organs, as it were, of flowering plants. Now here, you're a zoologist, not a botanist, right? Okay, so maybe I can get away with a little bit of iffy botany here. Uh, there are, as I understand it, a variety of structures within flowers. Uh, some flowers are, I believe the term of art is dioecious, which means that they have both male, hermaphroditic as it were, both male and female reproductive parts. Some are monoecious, meaning they have one or the other. On top of that, there are also flowers that give rise to compound fruits and multiple fruits. Uh, Professor Singh perhaps can give us the precise definition here, but I believe a compound fruit is one in which several parts are joined together as in the raspberry or blackberry, uh, and a multiple fruit would be something like a melon where uh, a single uh, fruit, I guess, contains a multitude of seeds inside. This depends on whether or not the fertilization of the, of the eggs within the ovum or the flower, whether you're having one egg at a time which grows into part of the compound fruit, or if you have a number of oba, I guess it's the plural, within the ovaries of the flower, which are all fertilized simultaneously. Anyway, for simplicity, I'm going to use the example of a crop like almonds, where you basically are producing one fruit, or in this case, one nut per flower. So let's suppose we have a field that a farmer has planted with big phi, big phi almond flowers. And the farmer has the services of bee bees. Let's suppose each of these bees is capable of visiting, by visiting, I mean, arriving at and depositing pollen on uh, small phi flowers. So maybe there's a million flowers, maybe there's a thousand bees, and each bee is capable of fertilizing 500 flowers. So in that case, my big phi is a million, my bee is, what did I just say, a thousand, and my little phi is 500. Okay, that means that the probability that any particular bee is going to land on any particular flower is the number of bees a flower visits divided by the total number of flowers. Incidentally, I'm also sort of skipping over another little factoid here is if you're a bee, you've got to pick up pollen from one flower before you deposit it on another. But let's suppose that these bees have already picked up their pollen and now they're on their way to other flowers. That means that the probability that any particular bee will not visit any particular flower is one minus the proportion of flowers it visits. So the, the probability that, that a flower will not be fertilized is basically the probability that it will not be visited by any bee, which is one minus the probability it would be visited by at least one bee. Okay, this is looking familiar to forms you've already seen. We can derive the value of the Martian pollinator. And then let's bring some economics in. This is sort of hand wavy, but let's suppose we could put 
a value on a fertilized ovum or what's referred to in the agricultural literature as a set seed. So basically the flower becomes pregnant as it were, or the, the plant, I guess I'll say the flower becomes pregnant as it were when the ovum within the flower has been fertilized by the pollen carried by the bee. And I'm supposing that we can put a value on this fertilized ovum, which is now gonna, if all goes well, continue to grow into an almond. We can do a variety of calculations in my paper. I did a variety of calculations to relate the value of this, this potential almond to the eventual market value of an almond. Then there's also, of course, the cost to providing all the materials necessary to, to plant the almond orchard and produce all the trees and all the flowers that grow into almonds. And once again, we can come up with an expression that's familiar in many ways to the ones before, which is going to uh, give us another straightforward intuition. Uh, so what is the value of the Martian pollinator? It's the value of, sorry, I should not have said for a last flower here, I should have said the set seed. So it's the value of the seed, which is now ready, it's been fertilized, it's now ready to grow into an almond. So it's the value of a potential fruit times the P times the number of flowers that each of these bees can visit, all times the probability that the flower that the bee can visit and pollinate hasn't previously been fertilized by another bee or pollinated by another mechanism. So again, there's a phrase in English is a little indelicate, but uh, you may have something similar uh, in India. There's no such thing as a little bit pregnant. So the idea being that the flower has either had its seed set or it has not had its seed set. And once that's happened, it, the arrival of additional pollinators makes absolutely no difference to that seed because it's already been pollinated and set off on its course to growth. Okay, uh, so in my paper, I argued that a paradox of efficiency may arrive. The pollinators are very prolific. It may not require to meet many crop needs. And then there's an interesting question. Well, how, many, how much land would you need to set aside for pollinator habitat if, if you wanted to have native pollinators fertilizing the California almond crop as opposed to European honeybees, the Apis mellifera here? Uh, incidentally, it's really a pheno remarkable phenomenon in the United States. Uh, there are millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of European honeybee colonies in the United States, basically hives. Half of those are put onto trucks and driven to the Central Valley of California in February and March of every year to provide pollination services for California almonds. And it's interesting, these honeybee hives are, are trucked all around the country as, as crops mature elsewhere in the land. Now, another thing to think about, and just sorry, I think I'm probably going a little too fast here, but the, the thought experiment that I'm thinking about is how much land would a farmer be willing to set aside to maintain native pollinators if they wanted to maintain native pollinators rather than just renting hives of European honeybees. So how much land do they have to set aside or would they be willing to set aside? Well, they're gonna think about what is the opportunity cost of setting aside land. Prime almond land, prime almond growing land in California goes to about $25,000, 25,000 US dollars per hectare. So they're gonna think about the opportunity cost of land. They're also gonna think about what it costs to rent honeybees. Uh, I believe the figure is two colonies per hectare uh, to provide pollination services. The price of, of bee colony, of rental value of bee colonies is, uh, varies uh, some with conditions that have been about $150 in recent years. So $300 per hectare to provide the services alternatively. And basically the takeaway of point of my paper was that if a farmer were to prefer to maintain land for native pollinators, so they did not have to rent bees from the back of the truck to come around to rent bees every year. If they were to prefer that alternative, if they're willing to set aside part of their land at $25,000 a hectare to provide habitat for those pollinators, 
they would not be willing to, under the best of circumstances, under the most conservational favorable set of circumstances, they would not be willing to set aside more than one eighth of their of the land they have. Now, again, I think I want to go back to your point earlier that I'm just talking about pollination services. There may be a variety of other services, both local and global, both local in terms of maybe of riparian buffers, global in terms of carbon sequestration, maybe other reasons that farmers should be setting aside more land in almond habitat. But again, the point I make here is that you can't justify setting aside a lot of land for the pollination benefits. And by the same token, if you cannot justify setting aside a lot of land for the pollination benefits, if you do, conserve a lot of land in the Central Valley of California, or the provision of other ecosystem services and environmental benefits, and the pollination benefits on the margin are going to go down rapidly, because basically we have an abundance of pollinators now, diamonds in water, we have more bees than we need. Uh, just a, did I actually show this one, or did I have it in the previous? Yeah. Okay. Just it's I go there first and then there, but let me just quickly say there are also very, very complex models of this phenomenon done by this is by the National Capital Project uh, Invest models. Uh, I'm not sure that you get a lot more reliable answers from going through the much more difficult models. Yes, sir. Hmm? I'm sorry. Yes, I said uh, <laughs> No, uh, well, that's actually an interesting point, but okay, the the owner of the bees is setting their European honeybee colonies in the fields, right? And they're doing that for, for two reasons. One is because they are paid approximately $150 per colony for the pollination services. What else are they getting? They're European honeybees, right? Whoever owns the colonies is, is selling the honey as well. That's confined to the bee boxes. So the, the value of the bee boxes would already reflect the co-product of the honey there. Is that answering your question? So it's already incorporated in the price being charged for the, the bee box. Suppose uh, you Well, there has been a lot of controversy about so-called colony collapse disorder in the United States and other countries, which is a, a condition which seems to be, well, there's a lot of controversy about it. There is controversy as to what is the cause. Some people have said that it is an exotic parasite that's largely responsible for it. Other people have said that it may be because European honeybees are, are put on the back of trucks and fed a steady diet of almond pollen for a couple of weeks, and then a steady diet of cherry pollen for a couple of weeks, and then a steady diet of apple pollen for a couple of weeks. And basically, they don't get a very diverse diet. And just like us, they get sick when they don't have diverse diets. But then there's also controversy about just how serious the problem is in practice. Now, having said that, of course, I think you're, you're alluding to a bigger point, which is if the European honeybee colonies are vulnerable to things like epidemics, then the, the native pollination services may be much more valuable. Then I think, though, we're talking about larger scale externalities that then whoever is maintaining habitat for native pollinators is providing a source 
of re reestablishment of pollination services on a very broad scale, and then it seems to be more like just some of our less tangible values of biodiversity preservation. Uh, I'm going to beg the audience's indulgence because this is the last one and I'm going to blab on for a few more minutes because I do want to get through uh, the last of the stuff I have here. Uh, I just want to talk quickly about one thing that I think this is a really useful example because it's something we should think about when we talk about ecosystem services in general. There has been a lot of recent interest in the California almond orchards in substituting the services of Osmia lignaria, which is better known as the blue orchard bee. It is a native insect that can effectively pollinate almonds. And so some farmers have said, well, if, if we have a native insect that can pollinate almonds, let's put aside habitat for this, this native species because that's gonna be a good thing for conservation. Well, it's not entirely the way it's worked. Farmers who are gonna set up the blue orchard bee uh, uh, pollination, were going to begin by reducing the biodiversity of the area in which they were gonna have the blue orchard bees by planting select species of wildflowers that the blue orchard bees could feed on when they weren't uh, pollinated almonds. They only pollinate almonds about two weeks a year. Then they were gonna sterilize the soil in the habitat to eliminate organisms that might compete with, eat or infect the flowers. Then they were gonna exclude other forms of biodiversity such as mice and toads that might eat the blue orchard bees. And then they were gonna put fine mesh over the whole thing to make sure the blue orchard bees didn't fly off and their investment was lost. So the point I'm making here is that they weren't talking about preserving biodiversity so much as they were talking about setting up a farm for a different species of domesticated animal. And the bigger point I wanna make here is that when we're talking about ecosystem services, sometimes we have to be careful. Are we really talking about preserving natural diverse habitats for providing ecosystem services for maintaining natural biodiversity? Or are we really talking about favoring some aspects of the habitat relative to others, some inhabitants of the habitat relative to others. Okay, having said that, I wanna wrap up quickly. I have a little bit on green accounting and calculation of genuine wealth. If you're an economist, you know all this stuff. If you're not an economist, I don't have time to explain it. So let's just keep going. And let's talk about an uh, important recent contribution to the economics of biodiversity, Sir Partha Desgupta's review conducted for the UK government. Here are in condensed forms, the six pages, the table of the contents for his review of the economics of biodiversity. Here is a part of the review dedicated to valuing biodiversity. Whoops. seemed more than a little strange to me that 609 pages, all dedicated to thinking about, and the stuff I skipped over was basically, uh, Dasgupta's approach was to think about how biodiversity contributes to the macro economy, how biodiversity contributes to the general welfare of humanity as represented in macroeconomic statistics and beyond that is represented by the accumulation of genuine wealth, by saving in both physical and human and natural capital. Well, in order to do wealth accounting, in order to do any sort of accounting, you need information on two things, quantities and prices. Accounting is, at the end of the day, multiplying prices by quantities and adding them up. So there was not a lot of, of emphasis put on figuring out the prices, the implicit values, the non-market values of services of natural assets and biodiversity. So where are the numbers that Dasgupta called for, including in better national accounting than come from? Well, they're gonna come from a variety of studies, the sort of studies I've been talking about with you for the last three sessions now. 
But we've learned some things or we've seen some things about the characteristics of these studies. Values are going to be highly nonlinear. The area of an ecosystem providing a service, as that area expands, marginal value of the service is typically going to go down considerably for the reasons we've talked about in a variety of cases. Conversely, as the area of natural habitat contracts, value of services may go up. But the takeaway point is that the, the value of a service is going to depend critically for the size of the habitat providing it. Again, nothing more or nothing less than the diamonds and water principle. We could also say it depends on the size and configuration of the habitat providing service. Remember those of you who were here last time, I talked about the example of Vincent and his colleagues and where the forest area was might determine the value of service provided by the marginal hectare uh, over and above just the sheer amount of it. Another thing is that <clears throat> the location of beneficiaries relative to the habitat providing the service is also gonna be important. Now, again, in Vincent et al's work, uh, the beneficiaries were, in fact, people a long way downstream, of course, providing water purification services. In other cases, it may be, well, you, must, you may need to have beneficiaries that are very close by. Foraging range of, of natural pollinating insects typically doesn't exceed a couple of kilometers. In fact, I think a couple of kilometers would be a pretty heroic flight for a lot of pollinating insects. So if you don't have a farm growing a crop which requires pollination within a couple of kilometers, of a natural area that's uh, a refuge for pollinators. That area is incapable of providing pollination services because I should be very careful, providing commercial or pollination services for commercial crops if there are no commercial crops nearby. I stopped myself there because it's a, it may be very important that such areas provide pollination services for the preservation of biodiversity. We should certainly be concerned about the preservation of biodiversity. We're going to have to measure those values, preservation values of biodiversity, using different means that I've been talking about. So, anyway, another aspect of this is the location of beneficiaries relative to the location of areas providing ecosystem services is going to be critically important. And linear extrapolation, the other side of that coin, is if you just extrapolate and say, I found that a meter of habitat was worth 50 US dollars here, and say, Okay, so that's going to be worth fifty dollars in China and in Iceland. <laughs> no, very very different circumstances. Uh, one thing I will say is, major exception to this rule is going to be carbon storage. That to the extent natural habitats are providing carbon storage, a ton of carbon is a ton of, is the value of a ton of carbon in terms of its climate impact is the same everywhere in the world. But then we get into some of the things I was talking about in, in response to the question about multiple values. As we start putting aside a lot of area for carbon storage, that may be changing the marginal value of, of provision of services for, for other things. So my takeaway, you may be familiar with this old cartoon from New Yorker here, is yes, it's great to talk about how what the contributions are going to be of maintaining natural capital in national even world level economic accounts and it's great that people are doing these focused studies on what the value is in particular well-defined contexts but until we get a better way of integrating or scaling up those values from small context to to the scale required for natural national accounting uh, we're sort of assuming that we have miraculous ways of doing this that we we don't at present uh it's one thing that <laughs> this is the sort of thing with all due respects to, to people who do this sort of work um, and you know ian bateman brett day people who have done this work in england are certainly very, very good economists, and I respect their work greatly in many ways. But I do worry about supposing that uh, maybe we take a farm in Kent and one in the Lake District and so forth and just extrapolate values to them without carefully thinking about what particular aspects of the habitat providing the values is important. And, in each of these particular areas. I, 
takeaway point is that multicolored maps, particularly even on a larger scale, uh, as a professional economist drive me nuts because I just don't think we have the, the fine level refinement for doing this. Uh, this was, this is rather amazing. They actually, you can't see it here, and because of the Mercator projection, it makes the high latitude areas look bigger, but they have actually colored in more than half of the terrestrial surface of the earth and said, uh, the blue is getting $25 an uh, hectare for ecosystem service values and the red's getting 250 and so forth. Again, I think that's really, really, uh, given the state of the science, uh, really, really speculative. So final thought, if you go back to what I started with, which is thinking about why we, we think about valuation of ecosystem services. And one of my favorite quotes from Alice in Wonderland, uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Or I guess the quote is actually, if I don't know where, you don't know where you're going, it doesn't really matter which road you take. I think one of the problems is we're thinking about biodiversity ecosystem services is a lot of times people are thinking about different things and not being clear on what sort of values they're looking at. So are we doing ecosystem service valuation to carefully allocate parcels between conservation or direct use? So do we want to do ecosystem service values to know where along the southeast coast of uh, India we should be maintaining mangrove uh, groves and what width should they be? Is that what we're really trying to do? And if so, as we think about those sort of things, and let's think about also, and maybe I'll switch examples, if we're thinking about setting up pollination habitat, if we're, if we're convinced that we want to set aside more values or more areas for pollinator, what we're doing is basically saying we're going to set up a checkerboard landscape in which this square is going to be for farms, this square is going to be for pollinators, the square is going to be for farms, the square for pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. The squares may be of different sides, but the, the, major, the main point I'm getting at here is we're talking about setting up a landscape with this sort of mosaic of more intensively and less intensively managed components. Is that what we want? Well, not entirely clear. Um, some conservation advocates, some ecologists say, no, that's not what we want. We don't want to have a, a landscape which is largely dominated by human activity and in which we're maintaining small representative chunks of natural habitat. Because when you have a landscape like that, what you typically don't have is a landscape large enough to maintain large predators, large herbivores, so tigers, bears, rhinos, elephants, splitting up the landscape, you, you either don't have enough habitat for those sort of organisms, or you're creating so many dangers for the people who live nearby that they're gonna resent having them there. So some people said, well, no, what we should be doing instead is intensifying production. I guess this, this goes two ways. Some people say we should be intensifying production on some portions of the landscape so as to reduce pressure on the others. Some people say we should just reduce our needs or desires as humans and, and make do with less. Um, and some people are saying, no, they like the idea of these mosaic landscapes. Uh, it's an open question as to what we want, but until we can sort out that question, um, we should be very careful in thinking about what our ecosystem service uh, analysis is leading us to. As somebody was asking the other day, or one of the questions that came up the other day was, I think I said in the context of my work in Chesapeake Bay, I said that if you, uh, in that case, you might actually justify setting aside fairly large tracts of land if you, for conservation, for providing the ecosystem service of, of pollution reduction. But that means, I think I tried to sidestep the question at the time, but as we think, if we didn't think about a mosaic of landscapes, we're gonna be having general equilibrium effects. We're gonna be having changes in the price of food relative to other things. It's gonna affect the price of everything. So I think the, the next frontier in ecosystem service valuation is going to be to figure out those general equilibrium effects. But I'm out of time and I'm not nearly smart enough to do that.
So let me conclude by first saying uh, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your patience for, uh, for putting up with me for as long as I have. Uh, thank you again for my old friend Srikant. I really appreciate this opportunity to come. It's, uh, I, it's been more than three years since I've been to India and it's always it's nice to be back. Um, and uh, well, anyway, thank you all very much. I really appreciate you. Uh, Thank <laughs> you.